This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. The Bible remains the world's best-selling book and yet is still considered very controversial by today's standards. It's a collection of 66 different books written by 40 different authors over a period of 1400 years that ended approximately 2000 years ago. It has been gathered from manuscripts going back as far as the second century B.C. And the 27 books of the New Testament, they have in excess of 5,000 Greek manuscripts that substantiate, support, and validate the writings of the authors. Yet, unfortunately, some scholars today share in a growing suspicion surrounding both Old and New Testaments as to whether or not they are indeed a reliable representation of God's Word. So, are these scholars justified in their suspicion? And if not, how do you eliminate this doubt? Can it be eliminated? Or does it just come down to simply faith? Well, stay with us as we address this question about whether or not the Bible is in fact reliable. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Tony Bukert. Well, hello there, friends, and welcome to another edition of The Armor of God. We're certainly glad you could join us for today's program. Now, what I want to talk to you about today is sitting right here in front of me. Uh, the Holy Scriptures, or the Bible, it's been translated in virtually every language known to man. It was written over a 1,500-year time span. It was written by over 40 different authors. It claims to be the inspired and written Word of God, the guide and the source book for Christians a book that foretells of future events, contains the plan of salvation, and the list goes on and on and on just how important this book is to us. As a matter of fact, that is validated and verified by the Apostle Paul in one of his epistle letters to a young evangelist by the name of Timothy, and he presses upon Timothy the importance of not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament, a collection of 66 different books that is considered, well, a guidebook for all of us. So let's see what Paul tells a young evangelist by the name of Timothy of just how important this book is and how the early New Testament church and those who would follow down through the millennium would consider it a very reliable source amongst the critics. And he says this. He says in verse, uh, let's go to verse 10. He says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life or manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at I, uh, Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecutions. And then he breaks into saying something else very, very important and vital to today's subject. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse deceiving and being deceived, but you must continue in the things which you have learned, been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, all Scripture given by inspiration of God, and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, certainly the Apostle Paul and the early New Testament church and those who fought along through the millennial thinks and thought that this book is very vital and important to their Christian growth as this Bible contains the plan of salvation and the set of values that Christians have. It is unfortunate 
that the criticism that has been levied against the Bible has its support in Hollywood, through parochial schools, and it has influenced through the airwaves and through all these kinds of different teachings how people perceive the part that the Bible plays and the importance that the Bible plays in all of our lives. I want to read to you a paragraph from an article about what people believe about the Bible or the critics believe about the Bible and what they say about it in this article that's entitled A Brief Summary of Why the Bible is Unreliable. It starts out with a false premise because the Bible is in fact very reliable and we're going to prove that today. Fundamentalist Christians view the Bible as the inspired and inerrant, the word inerrant means infallible, Word of God. They therefore say people should live according to biblical teachings. Modern analysis of the Bible, however, provides many reasons why the book cannot be considered a reliable guide. And this is called the loose brick theory. And what it is, is they say if they can prove just one little uh, fallible point in the Bible, that the whole Bible falls apart and therefore isn't reliable for our, our correction and for our use and doesn't instruct us on salvation, therefore has been erased as any intrinsic value to the Christian whatsoever. But before I go into some of the things I want to say about the Bible and show some how the Bible internally proves itself and validates itself, we want to make your, uh, your attention available to, uh, bring your attention to some of the articles and the CD that we have available to you today. The um, CD that we have available to you today is entitled, is the Bible reliable? It's going to go into a lot more depth than what I can today, uh, given our, our time frame and our time constraints. But also, there is going to be a booklet that you can get on how to study your Bible, because believe it or not, there's a difference between reading the Bible, which will give you some information of, of the Scriptures, and studying the Scriptures, which will give you more in-depth understanding and appreciation for the Bible. So won't you reach out to us, please, and get these free items and call us, if you would, please, at 888-578-8791. You can reach us on the World Wide Web at cgi.org, or if you prefer email, at info at cgi.org. While you're there, you might want to view our webcast, or the Times for our webcast that's held on every Saturday. Um, and also, we have a CGI digital app that you can download now, on your cell phone so you can watch sermons and even follow along on the webcast with a hymnal there if you'd like. So won't you please take some time and reach out to us and get these items complete, completely free of charge. So getting back to the topic, is the Bible reliable? Well, we already read a brief summary of why the Bible is considered unreliable. But, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have today as Christians or those of us who are searching for the truth and turning to the Bible for, for tidbits of truth and, and guidance in our lives is this anti-Christian culture warfare that has been in our media, it's been in our parochial schools from elementary to, to, to uh, high school to even some of the post-high uh, school education like colleges and some of these things. The topic of the Bible is just saturated with all kinds of disinformation and false criticism and false arguments that are levied against us. How do we even know what's reliable anymore when it comes to the scriptures? Well, one thing we have to do is we have to consider that there is this counter-Christian warfare that is going on and oftentimes it is played out on TV through the news media. And even some of the, the most cherished TV programs that some of us enjoyed over the years that once considered innocent, but every now and then they slip in on these little anecdotal things, these statements that really cause people to pause and think. And some of the things that are found in some of the programs that even our children watch, or maybe we watch growing up, are really just absurd when you consider it. Here are some statements from an article that I have entitled, What Do Hollywood Academic Critics Believe About the Bible? So, Hollywood Academic Critics. Now, in this article, there are some statements that are found on some of the TV programs that, that we have watched, namely that of The Family Guy and The Simpsons and even some programs on Discovery Channel and the A&E Network. But these are some of the things that they say about the Bible, okay? This, the Family Guy on the Cartoon Network says this, God is evil. Again, 
Family Guy on the Cartoon Network. Jesus was a drunk. This is complete character assassination, just like the religious leaders of Christ's time called him a wine-bibber. He, parenthetical, God, is my favorite fictional character, The Simpsons. The Bible was a 2,000-year-old sleeping pill, The Simpsons on the Fox Network. Adam and Eve, the show on a &E, Adam's wife was a promiscuous demon. The Discovery Channel and BBC America, Noah's Ark, the true story. Noah was a king who sold beer and animals, but was not permitted to return home after the flood due to debts. Interesting. It's not found in the scriptures anywhere. Noah and the Ark, Voyage to a New Beginning, also on A&E. Noah was an albino and babies fought demons. Sodom and Gomorrah on the History Channel. Sodom and Gomorrah was a myth. Well, that statement within itself is absolutely absurd, absurd because, you know, archaeology every day is discovering new things about the Bible. It is not proving the Bible wrong. It's actually proving it as a reliable historical source as well. It's about God's intervention in the history of mankind, how he's intervened in certain incidents. And even the site of Sodom, of Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah has been located, even found little bits of sulfur that were once on fire, towns that were turned into ash, just as the Bible said. So more and more, the Bible, in spite of the critics, is turning out to be considered reliable. People, peoples and individual people who are once considered fictitious characters are now, through evidential discovery, are now known to be very liable, uh, reliable people in the scriptures. Like, for example, Pontius Pilate up to a few decades ago, he was considered a fictional character until archaeology proved that he was real. The Exodus was considered a fictional event, especially the event of which Pharaoh pursued ancient Israel and God caused the Red Sea to collapse upon their chariots and consume the army. That was considered a fictional, but now there's archaeological evidence to support the fact that it actually existed. Chariot wheels and parts of chariots are found underneath the Red Sea. So just really is what at the base of this, and as those of us who are doing our best to live by this book, how do we wade through all, all the, the quagmire of disinformation and, and all the arguments that's been levied against it? Well, again, Paul, talking to Timothy, brings this up brings up a very uh, very sound principle in the scripture on, on exactly how we can do that. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll just go to verse 14. It says, Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers, but be diligent. It takes work, he says, to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, again, you can read the Bible, and when you and you, you read the Bible, certain bits of information are, are going to be indelibly imprinted on your mind. But there's a big difference between reading and studying. You know, a lot of people unfortunately consider the Bible just another classical piece of literature that will help help you become more of a well-rounded person, a well-educated reader but they don't really consider it a guidebook. It's just another one of those books that you can consider yourself a well-read, an educated person, much like people would consider Thoreau's civil disobedience writing as something that will make you into more of an intellectually, intellectually accepted individual in society. But studying the Bible gives us a whole new different perspective and helps us to counter-argue the debates that are levied against the relevance and the integrity of the scriptures that we find so important to us. And he continues here. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection has already passed, and they overthrow the faith of some. Now, how could some's faith be overthrown concerning this resurrection that had already been passed well, because they weren't reading the scriptures, the scriptures that have been recorded from them. Now, at this time, when you consider it, what really Paul is telling Timothy is that the Old Testament has validation because there really was no New Testament at this time. It was just now being formulated or being constructed. 
So to the Christian, we believe that most, most people do believe anyways, that the Old Testament and the New Testament is considered the Bible, the 66 different collections that are before us. So let's get into some of the debates on what people say makes the Bible unreliable and let's look at that and see if maybe through a little bit of a maybe a little bit of a Bible study we can show how some of these arguments are absolutely ludicrous and the Bible really doesn't have any contradictions it does have variations in their story but I would submit to you for your consideration that God purposely designed it that way because a variation isn't a contradiction you know what's been said that two contradictory statements cannot be the truth. Is, but is that true? Well, let's turn to a scripture in Acts, actually Luke chapter 1. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 1. I was going to go to Luke chapter 1 because it really presents Luke as the church historian. But really what I want to get to is talking about God's use of primary sources. He did purposefully and for our admonition and really through the use of eyewitness accounts or primary sources and through the variation of the narratives and the details that are in the scriptures, it doesn't disprove the credibility of the Bible. It's the variations and the different details of the different writers of the narratives that actually validate and make the, the Bible reliable. So in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, although many people have attempted to discredit Luke as an historian, they've been un unable to do so to this date. We read this. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles, whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them forty days, and speaking of them the things pertaining to the kingdom of of God. Now, one thing that we need to consider when we digest what Luke just said to us here, that the accounts that, that he made to, be the, uh, to make the accounts reliable, he used primary witness sources. In other words, people were witnesses to his life, his death, his burial, and resurrection. Now, what people will tell you is, is unfortunately, that what they'll say is, Eyewitness testimony is notorious, notoriously unreliable. Well, well, yeah, that's true to a degree. But really, it's not that their testimony is unreliable. It's just certain people in certain situations see things from different angles and different details are picked up. It's like when, when there's a crime. The police officers separate the witnesses so there's no collusion. And they'll ask what, what, the, what the perpetrator looked like. One person might say, oh, he was wearing a white shirt. Oh, no, 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 the shirt was blue. Oh, he was wearing jeans. Oh, no, he was wearing sweatpants. Oh, wait a minute, he was 5'10". No, no, he was 6'2". Now, all those details right there to somebody who, who doesn't know any better, who doesn't have any kind of investigative background will say, well, that testimony has to be thrown out. But really what it does is it proves something. When you have a group of witnesses that come together and you're, you're, you're really interviewing them to find out what the truth is, it's not the contradictions that prove them wrong. What proves them wrong and it proves collusion is the fact that when somebody approaches you or answers your questions and all the details match 100%, that proves collusion. So what people say about the different narratives, the different accounts, the different details the, you know, the, the, the details that might seemingly contradict, that actually proves and validates the credibility of the eyewitness to the events that unfolded before their eyes. That's when they match 100% that you start to worry about that. So today, with the time that we have remaining, I want to look at a certain situation, the Apostle Paul's conversion, and look at some of the things that people say about Paul's conversion, and specifically Luke's narratives concerning his conversion and how there are seemingly contradictions that discredit the story and people oftentimes will say that the story is fictitious itself. So staying in the book of Acts chapter 9, we read the account. It says this in verse 1, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. 
Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he, and he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who are you persecuting? It is harder, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. And the men, this is where the eyewitness testimony comes in, the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul rose from the ground, and of course, uh, when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. In other words, he was blinded. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. So there's very important details in the eyewitness testimony that we have to consider in the narrative here. In this account, we see that Paul's blinded. After seeing a light, he falls down after hearing Jesus. His men, or the disciples that were with him, this is what it says. They don't see a light. They heard a voice. They were man standing, but they don't fall down. And these details are very important when we go to Acts chapter 22 because you're going to see there's some variation. Acts chapter 22. And verse 1. Or let's go to verse 3 just for time's sake. Actually, let's skip down to, to verse 6 for time's sake. Now, it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. So the same account, same story that he pulled, told in Acts chapter 9. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Is that a contradiction? Let's look at this. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go to Damascus, and there you will be told the things, all things when, uh, when, which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of the light being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came to Damascus. So now here we have the other account. So there are some variations here. Okay, In this account, Paul's blinded after he sees a light. He falls to the ground. He heard Christ. His disciples saw a light, were afraid, but did not hear a voice. But in the first account, it says that he did. They did hear a voice. Interesting. Is this a contradiction? Well, let's keep reading. One more account. You can find that in, let's see here. It's going to be in um, Acts chapter 26. And I'm just going to skip through this for time's sake. I'm not going to have time to read it, but you can go over that uh, on your own time and, and re reread the scriptures. In uh, Acts chapter 26, 9 through 17, the account's pretty much the same. Except it says that Paul saw a light, he fell to the ground, he heard a voice. His disciples, they see a light, they fall down, but they're not blinded. And they don't hear a voice. So which is it? Well, as you reaccount each and every one of these different, different accounts of the conversion of Paul, you will see that the only scripture, the only item, as far as the details, the eyewitness testimony, that really the scriptures seemingly don't account for or answer is the fact, did the disciples hear the voice or did they not hear the voice? Well, really, when it comes to the Bible, we have to understand that it is the inspired word of God, but the Bible, since it was written by human beings, also has human characteristics to it, and it has certain literary license assigned to it. It can be metaphor, it can be hyperbole, it can be literal. There's all types of different literary devices that can be used when recounting a story. And also, it has to do with the details, when it, how it's important to the listener or the audience that you're, you're presenting it to. So Luke's intention here is not to give all the details in every one of these narratives, but it's a principle back in Isaiah chapter 28, which line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that all the scriptures come together. And this is why Bible study, friends, is so important. Because if we just read through this, it would appear to us 
as readers of the Bible, sometimes even as studiers of the Bible, these little details that we overlook as far as the, the, the scriptural uh, integrity, it might appear to be that the critics are true, that that loose brick theory might be true. Is Luke leaving something out? Is there another detail that we really need to consider? Well, you know, the Bible foretells of a time, friends, that scoffers in the last day would come. And a scoffer is much, much different than someone who's called a non-believer. See, a non-believer simply needs proof, just much like Thomas. Remember doubting Thomas? I'm not going to believe you uh, that the Lord resurrected unless I can put my fingers in his hands and in his side. And Thomas needed that proof. And Jesus gave him that proof when he appeared to Thomas. So there's a difference between a critical thinker, uh, a, a critical reader, then there is a scoffer, because a scoffer wouldn't believe Jesus Christ existed if they sat down and had dinner with him. They still wouldn't believe him. But what about this, this account? How do we reconcile this? Did they hear a voice? Did they see a voice? Does the integrity of the Scriptures fall or stand on this? Well, let's go back, if you would please, to Acts chapter 22. And we'll just look at this. We'll see what the Scriptures really say and see whether or not if there is a way that we can reconcile this. Okay, so let's read the account again, just a little bit. In verse 8, it says, So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light, and they were afraid. Okay? But they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told the things which you are appointed to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. So here's where the critics would say that we need to be worried about this. You know what the Greek really implies, though? That all the scriptures are the same. Okay? I'm not going to give the answer to whether or not they heard the voice or not. I want you to reach out and get the literature for the answer. And if you'd please call us at 888-578-8791. Again, that's 888-578-8791. And get the CD, Is the Bible Reliable? And the booklet, How to Study Your Bible. Hit us up on the web at cgi.org or email us at info at cgi.org. And friends, you keep on that armor and we'll see you here next time on the Armor of God. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call 1-903-939-2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org, or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.